so indeed, welcome to our climate briefing number seven. <clears throat> this is uh, a part of a series that we have here at, at FIA, which is a part of the politics of climate change um, project. Uh, and most of the, the previous um, briefings have been organized by my colleague Marco Siddi, who is here with us today, or by my other colleague Anta Vihma. Uh, and today we will talk about the uh, reports of the international uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change um, and its uh, and, and sort of the implications of uh, climate change on geopolitics. Um, and this is uh, sort of connected to the fact that several IPCC reports have come out this year. Uh, they have perhaps been a little bit overshadowed by the terrible events uh, in Ukraine. Um, and, and perhaps even some people might argue that uh, other geopolitical issues have somehow overshadowed the climate issue. But I think that all of the speakers today would argue that, uh, in fact, climate change, uh, as well as the IPCC reports, are very much connected to geopolitics and international relations overall. And that is exactly what we are here to talk about. And we have two very uh, highly uh, qualified speakers to, to talk about that. Uh, and just to give you some background, uh, of course, the climate change will have very si significant effects on human security and on security overall, but also on the, the sort of um, relations between countries. Uh, not to mention then the implications of uh, climate mitigation, which of course needs to be done as uh, e efficiently and effectively as possible, but it will inevitably also have some implications on uh, international relations and, and all kinds of other geopolitical issues and, and things that affect our, our security and human security as well as national security. Uh, now I just realized that I forgot to introduce myself. So my name is Emma Akala. Uh, I'm a senior research fellow here at, at FIA. Uh, and now I will move on to introduce our two speakers today. So let's uh, first introduce Taylor, who is our guest speaker uh, for, for today. Uh, so Taylor is a direct director of the Risk and Resilience Program at E3G, which is a very interesting think tank, which does very uh, uh, relevant work, at least in my opinion, on all kinds of climate issues. Uh, and Taylor in particular works with uh, governments and public institutions and the private sector to ensure their decision making is informed by a better understanding of climate risk. Uh, and Taylor has uh, an MPA in public and economic policy from the London School of Economics and also a dual bachelor's degree in psychology and English from the Syracuse University. And he has previously also worked uh, at the American Institutes for Research and as a consultant on green financial services. Uh, and then we have our own uh, Marco Siddi, uh, who is a senior research fellow also at FIA. Uh, he's also a Montalcini assistant professor at the University of Cagliari in Italy. Uh, and he focuses primarily on uh, EU-Russia relations and the EU energy and, and climate policy. And he's also an adjunct professor at the universities of Helsinki and Tam Tampere. Uh, and he teaches courses on EU and Russia relations. Uh, and uh, as I understand, he is at the moment in Italy uh, again teaching, uh, teaching courses. So very efficient of, of Marco. Uh, so let's proceed so that uh, first I will give the floor to Marco, who will talk a bit more generally about the IPCC reports. Uh, and then after that, Taylor will will come and talk uh, about perhaps more about the sort of risk aspects. Uh, but let's kick off with Marco. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Emma, for the kind introduction. Uh, and indeed, I'm talking from Italy, and uh, this puts additional strain uh, on me in terms of uh, weather and temperature, because it's very hot uh, already uh, here in, in, in Sardinia this week. Um, but it's also very pertinent, I mean, this, this, this situation to the topic we are 
uh, addressing today. Um, I would like to share with you a presentation. Um, I'm going to try to share it now. Uh, I hope you can see it uh, full screen now. Uh, that's great. So uh, yes, I will be talking about uh, the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel of, uh, on Climate Change. And specifically, I will focus on the first uh, report today. But before uh, getting to the substance, I would like to say a few words on, uh, um, on the panel itself and the way uh, it works. So just as a very brief introduction so that everyone is on the same page, uh, the IPCC is the body of the UN that assesses the science related to climate change. Um, and it has the function of providing policymakers with uh, scientific assessments, so essentially it provides the best uh, science on climate change. Uh, it analyzes implications uh, um, of climate change, future risks, and then uh, it uh, puts forward uh, information on uh, adaptation and, and, and mitigation. So it does so by compiling uh, regular reports. Uh, we have several types of reports that you see here. Um, so assessment reports, uh, such as the one we discuss uh, today, uh, or special reports on, uh, on specific topics, uh, or methodology reports, which are important for uh, uh, preparing uh, greenhouse gas inventories. Uh, it has three working groups, um, each of which uh, produce um, specific reports. So, for example, in my presentation, I will talk about uh, the report of working group one uh, on the physical science uh, basis. And um, uh, my and the other speaker today, Taylor, will talk about uh, the, the, the other two reports. I mean, the most uh, recent uh, reports produced by the working uh, groups uh, two and three. So working group one focuses on the physical uh, science basis, and I will uh, provide uh, a summary or some highlights of actually the summary for policymakers. So the most uh, accessible uh, uh, report, because uh, each report has uh, various formats. Some are much longer and uh, in a way uh, richer in information and scientific data. Um, what is important for analysts, uh, for policymakers, is to at least uh, have access and uh, read uh, the summary for policymakers, which is understandable to uh, to everyone, or should be understandable to everyone. Uh, so, what does the 2021 uh, uh, report of Working Group One tells us? Uh, so, the report was published in in the summer, in August, if I remember correctly. It tells us that uh, the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations uh, from 1750 is unequivocally uh, caused by human activities. So there is no doubt that it's humans who are uh, um, causing the increase in greenhouse gases, which is seen as the, the main cause of uh, global warming and climate change. Uh, it also tells us that uh, global surface temperature has already increased on average uh, in the planet uh, by 1.09 uh, degrees Celsius uh, compared to the pre-industrial era to the year to the period eight, between 1850 and 1900. Uh, if we look at uh, you know differences um, within the planet, the first recorded difference is that the increase was larger on land than over the ocean. Then I will show bit more, a few more graphs uh, concerning other differences within the planet. So uh, the report says that human influence is very likely, uh, you know, this terminology of very likely, uh, likely, or in some cases lower degree of certainty is used in the, uh, throughout the report. But in the case of uh, the global retreat of glaciers, the decrease in Arctic sea ice, uh, the report that states that it's very likely uh, that this is linked to human influence. Uh, and for instance, the Arctic Sea has already uh, uh, lost uh, a good part of its uh, of its uh, ice. Um, 
to the point that in uh, uh, in September, uh, in you know within 30 years, uh, a decrease of nearly half uh, was recorded. Uh, moreover, uh, it is often forgotten in, in public discussions, uh, the global upper ocean uh, has experienced substantial acidification, and we have also uh, seen an incre increase in, 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 in the global mean uh, sea level. Uh, climate zones have shifted progressively uh, polewards, so towards the poles, both in the northern and in the southern hemisphere. So these are some of the, uh, well, a couple of graphs that I took from, from the report, uh, which uh, show, highlight what I was saying a moment ago. Um, if we look at uh, the data, we have uh, both reconstructed data and historical data. So we, we start having reliable uh, data concerning uh, global temperature from, uh, you know, the second half of the 19th century. Uh, we see that there is an unprecedented uh, um, uh, warming uh, recorded uh, starting from the year, starting approximately from the beginning of the 20th century. And we see a spike, an increase, especially in, in the latter part of the 20th century, and even more so uh, in the first two decades of the 21st century. Uh, on the right, you see another interesting uh, graph which um, shows the role of uh, uh, well simulated uh, uh, human uh, and natural factors in causing this change, this increase in, in, in temperature. So if you look at the uh, brown uh, line, you see the, uh, the role of uh, human factor, factors in, partic in particular. Uh, whereas if you look at the uh, green line, you see the role of natural factors. And it is clear from this that uh, the change, the observed uh, changes uh, derive from human factors. So um, if we look at the role that uh, each uh, um, greenhouse gas has played, um, you see this in, 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 the, in the graphs here, uh, you will see that carbon dioxide is especially important. Um, it is the most uh, impactful uh, overall uh, greenhouse gas. Um, sometimes forgotten, methane uh, is also a very powerful greenhouse gas, and it has played a role, a key role in, uh, in the increasing global temperature. And nowadays we hear more and more to talk about methane leaks um, and also uh, commitments about commitments by uh, countries to, to limit methane emissions. So the uh, report also tells us that um, as a result of uh, human induced climate change, we have uh, more weather extremes across the globe. I mean, this is no uh, uh, no news for, for for anyone here because it's constantly in the in the news. So we have more hot extremes, increases in heavy precipitation, so flooding. Just uh, think of uh, the flooding in Europe uh, last summer in Central Europe. Uh, we have more frequent droughts, um, and because of the cumulative emissions. Um, in the industrial era, uh, we have to expect an increase in, in global surface temperature uh, at, at least until 2050 in all scenarios. Um, unless uh, there are quick uh, cuts in, uh, in greenhouse gas emissions, uh, global warming uh, will uh, certainly exceed uh, 1.5 and also 2 degrees uh, during the 21st century. Um, you know, these references to 1.5, 2 degrees are, of course, references to the targets of, uh, of the uh, Paris Climate Agreement, uh, which states that in order to avoid uh, catastrophic climate change, uh, global warming should be kept under 2 degrees and preferably uh, within 1.5 degrees compared to the pre-industrial uh, era. Um, and the other effects that are already visible are also have also been quite clear, even at uh, northern latitudes such as Finland in recent years. Um, we have seen an increase in fire weather uh, north of the Arctic Circle. Um, I'm 
I'm thinking especially of Sweden in this case and the summer of 2018. Uh, but we have seen also vast forest fires in Siberia um, in 2019, in, uh, in Brazil, um, uh, or um, in Australia uh, in the winter of 2019-2020, uh, if you remember the Australian bushfires. And there is increasing uh, pressure uh, on, on, on environments, uh, which is then reflected also on, uh, um, uh, on, the, on energy supply and on uh, food supplies, and of course on the availability of uh, fresh water. Um, the report also states that the Arctic uh, will probably be ice-free, completely ice-free, at least once uh, uh, by the year 2050. At the same time, while the picture is very bleak uh, on the whole, uh, there is also some hope, uh, hope which is uh, connected, however, to quick action, uh, um, action that would um, allow keeping uh, global warming uh, within two degrees. So here in these graphs, you see some uh, additional information um, or some, uh, um, well, a more graphic uh, view of uh, where uh, global warming would happen, uh, especially uh, um, because so far I've talked about um, global means. But you see that uh, global warming would be stronger uh, uh, closer to the poles and especially in the northern hemisphere. And the higher, the highest uh, uh, the uh, temperature increase, uh, the highest, the higher is the the, um, uh, the increasing temperature also in. Uh, uh, um, well, the difference uh, um, as we move closer to the pole and to the North Pole in particular. Um, the graphs below show the increase in, uh, uh, in precipitation. Uh, you will see that, um, I mean, you see in this graph that uh, there will be uh, substantial differences which are also connected to the degrees of uh, to the degree of global warming uh, some areas will see um, much more precipitation if you look at um, um, for example uh, um, the indian ocean uh, on the other hand uh, there will be areas such as mediterranean europe by the way uh, which will see a substantial decrease so more drought droughts and uh, more uh, desertification So let's um, talk a bit about scenarios now. So about um, what uh, we can expect. With uh, increases in CO2 emissions, uh, the uh, function of our oceans uh, and forests as carbon sinks, so their capability to absorb CO2 uh, will become less effective. Uh, so they will uh, progressively lose the role that they have of absorbing CO2 uh, from the atmosphere. And this will further increase, uh, uh, make the problem more acute. And, you know, it's, it's a bit like a chain reaction. Um, with higher temperature, uh, we will see a um, melting of the permafrost and the release of uh, green, further greenhouse gases that are trapped in permafrost. We will see more wildfires. Uh, and it is clear, as the report states, that many of the changes that uh, are already uh, happening uh, are irreversible uh, in the long run. So uh, overall, um, reaching climate neutrality, reaching uh, net zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible uh, would be essential to limit global warming. Now, another graph from the, um, from the report, I'm coming closer to the end. Um, if you look at, um, especially at the violet lines in the graph, so those which uh, show uh, high confidence, we see that, um, so on the left part of the graph, well, the kind of left and center, you see the effects uh, on land. And uh, on land, we see a very high confidence increase in uh, mean surface temperature in extreme heat. Um, and also, if we look at the uh, center um, right, uh, you see that the effects uh, will be especially um, um, strong on coastal areas. Um, 
So in this case, I'm talking about uh, coastal flooding, erosion, and, um, and we should keep in mind that a substantial part of the global population uh, lives in, in coastal areas. Uh, there are effects um, where we can expect, uh, you know, a high confidence increase also uh, in the open ocean. It's often forgotten, but this is, uh, we're talking about uh, ecosystems that are uh, essential in themselves and also to, uh, to human life uh, in the planet. So my final uh, slide uh, connects um, so this evidence, this physical science evidence, to uh, international relations, international developments more broadly, and perhaps we can talk more about this also in the, in the discussion. Um, clearly, uh, some of the worst effects of climate change affect the global south, and um, so they uh, add up to already existing problems in countries that um, ironically have contributed much less to cumulative uh, greenhouse gas emissions in, in history. Um, so this calls for action, especially from the global north, from the richer countries. And one of the questions is whether policies that have been implemented so far are sufficient. So are development aid schemes such as the ones we have seen so far uh, enough? Um, is there enough solidarity by richer countries? If we look at other cases of global governance in the recent past, and here I'm thinking especially of uh, pandemics and vaccines, uh, I would raise some doubts that there is enough solidarity. Um, at the same time, climate change and the public policies uh, related to uh, climate change also pose a challenge uh, domestically uh, to um, countries from the global north. Um, so public policy has to focus uh, on the question of, uh, of a just uh, energy transition. And we have already seen some instances where uh, putting too much burden on certain categories, on certain social strata, uh, especially um, uh, the lower middle class, uh, is unfair and can lead to a backlash, to a negative reaction. Um, so two final points. Uh, one is, um, I think has been repeated many times in public discussions already, um, climate change leads to more international conflict. It leads to more migration. Let's think about migration from the Sahel uh, towards uh, Europe, for example. Um, and there is also a link between uh, climate change, um, so some factors uh, leading to climate change and pandemics. Uh, this is. This was one of the important topics uh, during uh, uh, COVID-19, during the pandemic. So uh, we need a change in the way we relate uh, to nature and to natural resources in particular. Um, and still for the, for the sake of public policies and of uh, global, global climate action, it is important uh, to define which actors are particularly uh, central for uh, climate action. Um, what we have seen recently is that the state remains or retains a key role um, and uh, recovery plans and uh, allocation of uh, recovery plan, uh, post COVID-19 recovery plan resources to uh, um, sustainable spending to climate action uh, once again demonstrates that the state is extremely important in this uh, respect. Uh, but of course, we also need the multilateral level, so a framework when uh, uh, framework where states um, negotiate, um, and once again, uh, the UNF uh, C uh, is of course key in this respect. Um, at the same time, or on the other hand, uh, rising global uh, competition, geopolitical competition, uh, puts a challenge uh, to uh, global climate governance uh, because it goes in the opposite direction of the multilateral uh, understanding that is necessary to, to achieve uh, effective uh, climate action. OK, stop here for uh, with my initial remarks. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Marco. That was really interesting. Uh, I will give the floor now to Taylor and just remind actually or mention to the audience that 
Uh, if and when you have any questions to the speakers, uh, please write them to the chat and I will then uh, take them up later on in discussion. Uh, but go ahead, Taylor. Great. Um, well, thank you very much um, uh, to the whole team, really, um, at SIA uh, for organizing this event and for the chance to, to speak to you today. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I will uh, also share my screen if I'm able to. Um, Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so I, I just wanted to talk briefly about uh, three things today, really. Um, the first is what I think some of the new messages are and the new findings that have come out from the latest IPCC report. So these are, as Marco has said, working group two, which focuses more on impacts and adaptation and vulnerability, um, and then working group three on mitigation. Um, second, a few thoughts about why that matters for climate action and geopolitics. Um, and then finally, a few um, recommendations, let's say, for, for how governments could or should respond to that in order to, to try and increase cooperation and, and reduce any potential tensions. So just first looking at working group two, um, uh, there are a few key takeaways for me. I mean, the first is that I think impacts are really hitting earlier and harder than expected. Um, this is not the language that the IPCC uses, but I would say, you know, we're really on the wrong end that you'd want to be on of the potential scenarios given um, the current temperature rise. So um, uh, the report focuses also more than it has in previous um, versions on impacts to people and to societies and ecosystems, for example. So we're losing entire species. Um, there are clear impacts on things like food and water um, resources but also health, um, which is something Marco also mentioned in his remarks, that the, the occurrence of climate-driven um, diseases has increased. Um, and then, of course, there's an impacts on um, infrastructure. But the point really being, you know, climate change is here. It's affecting people quite severely right now. This is not just a problem for the future. Um, the second point is that the, the risk is complex and systemic. So it's not really just the, the direct physical impacts like damage to infrastructure from flooding or extreme weather, what have you. Um, you know, climate change really cascades across societies. Um, it, it interacts with other vulnerabilities, with socioeconomic dynamics. So, for example, it's contributing to humanitarian crises where you have extreme weather, uh, for example, in places with high vulnerability. Um, climate and weather extremes are driving uh, displacement in all regions, which is something the IPCC finds with a high degree of confidence. Um, so it's really, it's the second and third order impacts as well as the direct physical impacts that we need to be concerned about. Um, and again, in terms of conflict, so the IPCC says the evidence for that link um, continues to be weak, but there's certainly a growing body of research um, and an evidence base. And there are many security and intelligence and defense officials who, uh, and analysts who've said for years that climate is uh, at least has the potential to be among the drivers of, of conflict and instability. Um, so I do think that that sort of evidence base is growing. Um, the third point is really that the risk rises significantly above 1.5 degrees. Um, and in particular, that's where uh, the risk of breaching tipping points increases substantially. So we initially thought tipping points were, were only associated with sort of runaway climate risk of three or four or five degrees. But there's some observational evidence even now that things like the West Antarctic ice sheet um, might be showing signs of irreversible instability. Similarly, with the Greenland ice sheet, um, signals from the Amazon rainforest, the Gulf Stream, um, that they may be approaching tipping points already, um, which is concerning, of course. Uh, the, first, the fourth point being adaptation efforts are falling short. Um, so what we're already doing to try to adapt to climate change, it's fairly fragmented. It's small scale, it's mainly focused on either particular projects or sectors. Um, and, it's, and it's usually in the sort of planning stages rather than implementation at the moment. But there are also um, hard and soft limits to adaptation. So in other words, there are impacts that we simply won't be able to adapt to from an engineering standpoint. And in some cases, it's um, financial or governance constraints that are preventing that happening. 
Um, but the point really being that we have to start facing up to addressing losses and damages from climate change. In other words, the things that we can't avoid. Um, and those losses and damages, and this speaks to um, points that Marco has made, are concentrated largely in the poorest and most vulnerable um, populations. And then finally, and this is related to the to the previous point on soft, soft adaptation, um, you know, engineering alone will not solve the problem. So how you respond to this matters. It's going to require um, institutional reforms, governance arrangements, uh, and you need to consider um, issues related to justice and equity, for example. And I won't spend too much time in this graph. Um, it's, it's taken from the working group to summary for policymakers. But the point is really this um, bar chart on the right, which is sometimes called the burning embers graph. And the main point here is that you have these different reasons for concern, as the IPCC calls it, so uh, unique and threatened systems, extreme weather event, distribution of impacts, et cetera. And you can see from the red and the purple areas, it shows that above um, fairly low temperatures, and certainly above 1.5 degrees, you're starting to see either high or very high um, impacts. Uh, so we're really sort of at a threshold at the moment with some important choices to make, including about um, uh, questions around how much risk you know, we uh, collectively are willing to accept. And I think that's summarized quite nicely in the last sentence from the, from the summary of policymakers, um, which is any further delay in action on adaptation and mitigation will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future world. So this is coming from scientists who are typically very cautious. Um, this is a slow and consistent driven process. Um, so it's strong language, but I think it reflects the level of risk that they're seeing in the world and in the models. Um, and then if we fairly quickly just move to the mitigation report, so that's working group three. Um, First and maybe most critical message is just that the game isn't over. So um, emissions have continued to rise, but the rate of growth declined in the last decade compared to the previous one. Um, the current pledges the countries have made would likely mean at least a brief overshoot of 1.5 degrees, but then you could fall down relatively quickly thereafter. And then, of course, even then, you know, 1.6 degrees is a lot better than 1.8 degrees, which is a lot better than 2 degrees. So there's still a lot of reasons um, to take action. Um, the second is that solutions exist, so um, we have the ability to deeply decarbonize societies, but that's going to require deep economic changes, not just technology deployment. Um, uh, and, you know, more money, for example, continues to go to fossil fuels than to mitigation and adaptation, despite everything we know about climate risk. Um, the third point is that the economics are working really in favor of climate action, so clean energy is affordable. Um, most of the people on this call have probably seen that the cost of renewables has fallen quite dramatically since 2010. Um, the fourth is that climate action isn't, uh, it doesn't have to come at the expense of other global development goals. So it's compatible with development. You can address climate change while also reducing inequality and, and poverty and increasing well being, for example. The fifth point is that uh, you need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, but that's not a silver bullet, um, and it doesn't sort of solve all of your problems. So, um, uh, you know, this is not in the IPCC report itself, but there are models that show you can invest quite a bit in things like bioenergy with carbon capture or direct air capture, so sucking carbon directly out of the air. Um, and it gives you a relatively small impact in terms of reduction of global temperature. Now, if you've done all the other things you need to do, um, and you're trying to go from sort of 1.7 degrees to 1.5 degrees, that's really important and probably worth that investment. But the point is it's not a sort of panacea and it shouldn't delay um, other efforts that can be scaled up more immediately. Um, and finally, the demand side really matters. So what people are doing as individuals, including driven by policy, um, can, make, can make a big difference. Um, so as a non-scientist, that's sort of my quick summary of what I think some of the new messages and most important takeaways are of these most recent reports. Um, but if we move to the next slide, uh, I've pulled some headlines um, from the past couple of years from news articles just to show that trying to illustrate the point that I think, you know, the choices we've made not to mitigate more, not to invest more in resilience have real um, consequences um, and wider consequences geopolitically. So um, potentially those include consequences for global stability, so food and water insecurity can clearly drive instability. Um, large unplanned movements of people, of course, can cause geopolitical tensions. 
Um, there are implications for the negotiations and developing countries feeling like they're not getting enough out of the bargain in terms of their need to, um, to adapt to some of the impacts we're already seeing. Um, that's related to some of these discussions around debt distress. So you have, um, you know, not only are some of these small vulnerable countries getting hit with impacts themselves, but their vulnerability to climate risk is also leading them to pay um, higher interest payments on their sovereign debt, for example. So they're sort of being hit by a one-two punch. Um, and then there's also the possibility that impacts that particularly developed countries are seeing at home are leading to, for some to call for reductions in overseas development assistance abroad. So it's sort of the argument of, well, we have vulnerable populations here. Why are we spending money overseas? That has pretty clear um, implications for, for international cooperation. I think the main point here just being um, it's been a choice that we've collectively made not to invest more in managing risk um, and, and the resilience of some of these systems that we rely on, you know, food, water, infrastructure, et cetera. Um, and I think the concern is that that choice is likely to drive um, more defensive geopolitics, countries potentially to move away from multilateralism. So what could that look like just at a very high level? Well, I would argue that, you know, historically, um, climate geopolitics has really been driven mostly by clean energy opportunity, um, opportunities and challenges around the energy transition, so competition over clean energy opportunities to secure new metals and minerals, for example. I don't think that will stop because I think the energy transition won't stop. But um, looking at the science, looking at some of the impacts we're seeing around the world, you could be moving to a scenario where um, understanding of climate risk, um, anticipation or expectation of breaching tipping points, um, for example, could become as big, if not a bigger driver of geopolitics than the energy transition itself. And I think that's likely to impact um, geopolitical dynamics, but it's unclear if that leads to more international cooperation or more instability. And just thinking again at a fairly high level of what this could look like in practice, you could have more fights over accountability related to, to international commitments. So if countries are getting more serious about dealing with climate risk, they're likely to also um, get more serious about tracking and assessing, you know, who has put down ambitious targets, who is meeting them, who is not. And you're already seeing some of this play out in the negotiations in terms of countries very focused on delivery of commitments that have been made. Um, the need potentially for some crash sort of mitigation programs is likely to lead to more interest in geoengineering approaches. Um, one that's most often talked about is solar radiation management, so essentially reflecting sunlight back into space. Um, but that could have uneven distributional impacts in terms of rainfall in different parts of the world. It's been untested at a large scale. It's largely ungoverned space. Um, it doesn't address problems like ocean acidification, um, which has implications for food security globally, but particularly for small islands nations. Um, there's the carbon removal technologies, which I mentioned before, approaches like bioenergy with carbon capture or direct air capture. There are different degrees of risk, which is different approaches, um, but both would require most likely enormous amounts of land, uh, land that's currently being used in many cases for other things, um, including food production. So that raises some difficult questions there. Um, again, there's the, the cross-border migration issue. So you have organizations like the World Bank predicting a pretty substantial increase in climate refugees um, currently uh, lacking legal protection. And again, there's climate as a driver of, of conflict and instability. Um, uh, there, this is not an exhaustive list. There are other areas, um, including those that Marco mentioned around competition over resources in the Arctic, for example, um, the role of petrostates and the like. Um, but just a few, uh, a few initial thoughts. I think there are some positive stories here. So if there's a silver lining of the climate impacts we're seeing, the, the stronger science, COVID, even Ukraine, it is shining a spotlight, I would say, on resilience um, and the need to build the resilience of some of these essential systems. Mitigation is getting cheaper. Adaptation and resilience are not on par, I would say, in terms of attention and resources and mitigation. Um, but they are getting a lot more attention these days. Climate is less of a silo, so countries are integrating climate change into their foreign and economic policies. Um, and there are powerful new constituencies that are that are also working for change. So I think BlackRock, you know, the world's largest asset manager, has something like 100 new impact analysts. The IMF is hiring dozens of climate analysts. 
So things are things are changing in that sense, um, and there are there are positive things to build on in terms of trying to manage some of these some of these potential um, areas of tension. But I just wanted to close briefly with a few initial thoughts on uh, what governance institutions, civil society could could focus on, again, in trying to manage some of these dynamics. Um, the first is developing sort of more comprehensive whole of government climate risk management strategies. Um, the ones that exist, I think, tend to focus on kind of optimistic assumptions, mid-range scenarios. You need to account for a full range of scenarios really to, to have a comprehensive assessment. Um, again, it's it's doubling down on integrating climate into things like foreign and development policy and planning. Um, I think prioritization of financial and technical support for climate vulnerable developing countries on resilience, adaptation, and loss and damage will be really critical. Um, more dialogue between major emitters and vulnerable countries on management and cooperation around some of these negative emission technologies would be helpful. Um, the UN does have a climate security mechanism um, which was launched several years ago. Um, I think it could be more fully resourced. Um, it's played a largely sort of uh, coordination role and research role so far, but I think it could start to demonstrate, you know, success on the ground in addressing climate security issues through, for example, pilot projects in fragile regions. And then some sort of international dialogue or task force around the governance of geoengineering approaches, I think would, would probably be helpful. Um, so that's a, a fairly brief, hopefully, um, overview of, of a rather complicated topic, um, but hopefully somewhat useful. And um, I will uh, stop sharing now and looking forward to the, to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Taylor. That was really a very um, comprehensive uh, sort of summary of uh, a very complex issue. Thank, thank you for uh, providing that and it was really interesting and I think that both of these uh, presentations have have shown that uh, not only do the IPCC reports sort of themselves uh, kind of provide us with the information that we need in a way to to understand uh, how climate change is a risk uh, for global security in itself but then also how uh, it kind of accentuates these ex these existing risks and maybe also creates new sort of complex uh, risk situations. Uh, but I'm also happy that Taylor provided some examples of uh, perhaps ways in which we can mitigate these uh, risks and, and and sort of at least try to start to address them. Uh, I would still remind our audience that you can write your questions in the in the chat, and I would be happy to. Uh, post them to the speakers, uh, but while we're waiting for that, uh, I actually have some questions, of course, myself as well. Uh, and I would maybe start off by asking you guys how you sort of see the, the current situation after the Russian attack on Ukraine and how that uh, obviously uh, increases the sort of already quite complex uh, risk situation and sort of ties into these uh, climate risks. But then also perhaps if you want to comment uh, on potential opportunities that there might then be in tackling these risks also in association with the, with the Ukraine situation. Uh, so maybe we'll start off with uh, Marco. Okay, thank you, uh, Emma, for this question. So, um, my short answer would be that uh, the war in Ukraine uh, has predominantly negative impacts. Um, so, there could be positive impacts, but maybe I'll, I'll proceed with a bit of order. Um, so, the negative impacts come, but well, from the well, the, the 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 consequence, the direct consequences of the war. And I don't mean just in terms of, of pollution, but also in terms of uh, um, higher um, geopolitical competition. Uh, so more competition means less uh, cooperation at the multilateral level. Uh, and this is a level that we need for climate action. Um, so we have to see whether uh, climate negotiations will also be uh, weaponized. Um, of course, there is a lot of talk, especially in Europe, uh, of accelerating 
um, the energy transition by giving up uh, Russian fossil fuels. Um, and this could be one of the at least partial positive effects. Um, but at the same time, if we read the Repower EU documents, yes, um, they do stress that um, uh, the energy transition should be accelerating and this will contribute to decreasing dependence uh, on, on Russian uh, gas and oil. Uh, and of course, we already have an embargo on coal uh, imports. Uh, um, uh, However, uh, the document also states that new investments will be made into fossil fuels from other sources. So uh, this is also something to keep in mind. Um, and um, we have also seen the perverse effect that um, that, that sanctions uh, are actually uh, making Russian fossil fuels more attractive to others. Uh, so there are several elements that have to be uh, kept in mind. But um, my uh, fear is that in the long term, the negative effects will prevail because, uh, um, as you know, uh, climate action has to be global uh, and it has to involve not just a few countries of the global north, but everyone else. Uh, Russia is the fourth, fifth largest uh, emitter of uh, um, uh, greenhouse gases, so it has to be uh, on board. And so, of course, the same applies to China. Um, so yeah, well, uh, maybe I stop here, but I'm not very optimistic about this. I understand it's quite difficult to be optimistic <laughs> these days. Uh, but uh, Taylor, what are your thoughts? Sure. No, I mean, I I, I very much agree, I think, with, with the points that Marco has made. I, you know, there's, there's no um, successful solution to, to global climate change that doesn't involve um, global cooperation. You know, we have to, to to move too quickly, learn from learn from each other's experiences. Uh, it's too complex to solve unilaterally. So, to the extent that that the uh, that the war in Ukraine could lead to a you know breakdown in in terms of cooperation or multilateralism, that would certainly have um, potentially a negative impact on on climate cooperation. We don't know yet how specifically it will it will affect the climate negotiations within the UNFCCC. Um, but there are some countries that are more supportive of, of Russia in this context, for example, and that could carry over. Um, you've already seen, for example, um, you know, there are the, the IMF special drawing rights that have been sort of pledged to support developing countries, including with things like resilience, um, are there's a sort of movement underway to redirect some of those special drawing rights towards recovery in Ukraine, for example. So you can just see that there are these kind of pressures um, to divert maybe attention or resources that was that was potentially going particularly to helping vulnerable developing countries with climate impacts or mitigation um, being directed in other in other in other areas. You know, the only sort of potential sort of Silver lining, as I say, of which I mentioned in the presentation, is I do think many of these things, including the pandemic, as well as the war, as well as the real world impacts and the science, I think that there is it is drawing more attention to what this failure to invest in resilience of these essential systems means. You know that we are not prepared for many of these kinds of shocks, and that that is causing real harm and loss and damage um, and conflict in some cases and, and increased competition um, uh, for human beings uh, throughout the world. And so to the extent that there is kind of a recognition, you know, that, that resilience has been under-prioritized previously and that risk management has been under-prioritized and risk management, including mitigation, um, that could be, you know, a, a, a good thing, but it's in this broader context where I agree with Marco that, that most of the signals are are trending in the in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is now a question in the chat from Lena Ylamononen, uh, who is sort of uh, continuing with the Ukraine theme uh, and with the question of food security. Uh, and of course, we are now facing very likely global food crisis, uh, partly 
caused by the, the attack on Ukraine. Uh, so how do you see that as a source of geopolitical conflicts? And well, maybe Taylor can now start. <laughs> Sure. Yes. I mean, I, I would um, absolutely. I, I think uh, for, even before uh, even before the invasion of Ukraine, um, the World Food Pr Program was warning um, that the situation was quite dire and there was a food crisis on the horizon. Um, and now, of course, by now we've all sort of heard the statistics about how much of the uh, you know Russia and Ukraine account for in terms of um, in terms of wheat uh, and grains and, um, you know, the amount of food that, that is not able to leave uh, Ukraine because of the war. So uh, I think food security um, was uh, quite a large challenge, you know, six months ago, and it has become uh, sort of supercharged at this point. Uh, and of course, is very relevant for, for climate change as well. You know, some, some of these international institutions um, the UNFAO, the World Food Program, have started accounting for climate change in their in their planning and their decision making, their operations, and you know thinking about indicators of what climate will mean in terms of their ability to meet their mandate. Um, uh, you know, again, one can only hope amongst all the gloom that this will lead to them to sort of redouble those efforts. Um, and thinking how they how they sustainably meet their meet their mandate and some of their targets, given some of the some of the pressures that that the war in Ukraine has caused, as well as climate impacts. But um, but yeah, it, I, it's it's a huge priority because of course it has global global imp implications. Exactly. How about you, Marco? Do you want to add something? Yeah, just add to what Taylor was saying. Um, uh, the war in Ukraine, war in general and uh, climate change are uh, mutually reinforcing uh, um, factors when it comes to food security. Um, and there is already quite a lot of uh, uh, speculation about what uh, could happen, given the fact that uh, Russia and Ukraine export uh, a lot of wheat, for example, to North African countries. Um, if we remember in 2011, in the increase in food prices was one of the causes uh, of, of the Arab Spring. Um, so we can expect uh, more um, internal disruption, which then also reflects on international and transborder uh, phenomena such as migration. Um, so maybe another example uh, in this respect, um, concerns uh, the role that um, if we take the climate, the energy crisis in Europe, uh, so the war in Ukraine is having a, a direct impact because of the role of Russia as, as an energy provider and uh, Ukraine as a transit country. Uh, um, but climate change is making things worse. So now um, we are reading that because of the lack of precipitation in some parts of Europe in the in the previous months, uh, hydropower um, production will be hydropower generation will be lower in in the summer, and there might even be uh, issues in terms of um, water avail availability to cool down nuclear reactors. Uh, so uh, the energy crisis might be exacerbated by the simultaneous uh, um, um, reduction in the production of uh, in the generation of uh, hydropower and nuclear power in southern Europe, especially. Hmm. Exactly. OK, we don't have a lot of time left, which is a shame because we could continue this interesting discussion for a long time, I think. Uh, but one thing that I, I still wanted to ask in the end uh, is is actually concerning the role of the IPCC itself uh, because I've ended up in in several or a few discussions lately uh, where people have sort of um, kind of complained that uh, the IPCC is somehow not efficient enough uh, in putting out sort of the information uh, that it it provides uh, and that that this is one reason why why the reports, for example, have been overshadowed and they are not taken up by governments and so on. Uh, what do you think about that? And is there anything that uh, somehow should be done about it? <laughs> and maybe uh, Taylor can start again. <laughs> sure. Um, 
Uh, I mean, look, I think ultimately the IPCC does a pretty good job at the at the function that it has, which is to synthesize a huge amount of resource research over several years and convey you know the messages where there is strong um, or in some cases less strong consensus. Um, uh, of course, decision makers need to take that as one input. Um, they need to take some of the more recent science and research that comes out as that process is underway into account. In other words, you know, there are things that happen in the scientific community and studies that come out while that don't end up in the latest IPCC report uh, because of how the process works. And that also needs to be needs to be an input to decision making. You know, fundamentally, I think there need to be better decision support tools that allow governments and institutions to take the science and turn that into policy. And there needs to be more people also who are trained to do that. Um, because the science is one thing, then there needs to be, you know, to, to go through the process that says, okay, what does that mean in terms of decisions that we have to make as governments, as inter international institutions, uh, as companies in some cases? Um, and so that, I would say, is where the biggest gap is. We have quite a bit of data and we have very good science. I think what we need are those sort of decision support tools um, and processes to turn it into into good decisions. Exactly. How about Marco? Yeah. Um, so I, I recently uh, read a book. Um, it's a long interview with a, a German uh, climate journalist. Um, it seems that one of the key issues is that um, compared to uh, phenomena such as COVID, uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, or, you know, sudden developments, uh, climate change, I mean, journalism on climate change is still unable to attract uh, sustained attention. I mean, it does attract attention, but not, I mean, comparatively less uh, than other phenomena. Um, so there is an issue which is about the subject itself and the fact that climate change, while it's getting worse and worse, it's still, um, it is still not seen as something having immediate explosive effects, uh, even though it will increasingly uh, do so. Um, so there is a, an objective uh, difficulty in, in communicating and in making this uh, topic uh, prominent. Um, and connected to this, so connected to um, the problem uh, at getting public attention on the topic, uh, um, it's also the you know the way journalism works. Um, you need to get topics that catch the eye uh, to sell and make money. Uh, so it's really another intrinsic challenge in communicating uh, the, the a catastrophic issue. I, I'm beginning to say, you know, that um, the climate crisis. Uh, is actually already now and in, with, within a few years it could be a much worse crisis than the war in Ukraine. But these comparisons don't always are not always effective <laughs> and they're also risky for the speaker depending on the audience by the way. That is very true I'm afraid yeah. Um, unfortunately yeah that's that's all that we have time for. Uh, Mariam actually just posted in the chat uh, a link to a report, I think, or a network, uh, Climate Councils Network, which uh, everyone in the audience might be interested in, in checking out. Uh, but at this point, uh, I would first of all thank our, our speakers for, uh, I think, communicating this uh, difficult and apocalyptic issue in a very uh, interesting and, and also very uh, useful, beneficial way uh, for us to understand. So I think it's been a really interesting discussion and hopefully we'll continue in some other other context or, or format. Uh, and thank you also for the audience. Um, and yeah, I think that concludes our discussion. So thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you very and much. Taylor. And the audience.